Hello there, friends, and welcome back to another episode of the Midweek Refill. I am Bishop A. Reginald Littman, Senior Pastor of the New Mountaintop Church, and I'm excited to be the host of this Bible exploration experience. Please do me a favor, like, share, subscribe, hit the bell notification, and do let others know that we are now on the air just in case there's somebody you know and love who might be interested in learning more about the Bible or more about the 12 apostles, this would be a great series to forward the link to, to let somebody know that this teaching is available. And so I'm excited to share this teaching with you as we begin part three tonight on lessons from the 12 disciples. And tonight we're going to talk about James the Greater. And we're going to be looking at a journey of faith and transformation. So if you're ready, let's jump into this study. So again, I want to welcome you to the Bible study. And again, this week, our subject is James the Greater, who was one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. So we want to again thank you for tuning in each and every week and also before we begin let me also not forget to remind you that there is a free pdf handout that is available for your download right there in the description box below the video so i want you to make sure you access that we put a lot of work into it to prepare it it is essentially a transcript if you will of this study but it goes a lot further because it contains personal discovery questions which can enable you to take a deeper dive into the scripture and really learn how to appropriate what I'm teaching here and take it to another level. Plus, you can share that document with your family, with your friends, with your relatives, with your neighbors, co-workers, and have your own little discussion group about the discussion questions that go back over the lesson. So it's a really great tool to assist you. And that's why I take all the time I do to make that available for you. So let's jump in now and talk about James, the greater, one of the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ. So while James is often overshadowed by the other disciples, his life is actually a remarkable testament to faith, leadership, and transformation through Christ. And in this study, we're going to explore the background, the calling, and the key moments in James's ministry and be able to draw some very valuable lessons that can enrich our own spiritual journeys as we traverse through this journey called life. So as we delve into the life of James the Greater, may his journey of faith and transformation inspire us to follow Christ wholeheartedly, embracing servanthood leadership. And I hope that it'll cause us to be willing to stand firm on our own faith, even in the face of adversity. So now let's embark on this study together, drawing strength from the lessons that are found in this remarkable life of James the Greater. So let's begin with a passage of scripture relevant to his calling. So we find in Mark chapter number three, verse 13 through 17, the New International Version reads like this. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he appointed, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, to them he gave the name Barnerges, which means sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, 
and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. Now, in this passage, we see that Jesus goes up a mountain and he chooses his 12 disciples and he names them. It's like he's saying, you are chosen. You are special. And that's what I love about this passage. It's all about recognition and purpose. Jesus, like in life, when you discover your calling, it's a moment of pure revelation. But here's the real kicker, the heart of it all, when Jesus calls his disciples, is not just about them, it's about all of us as well. He's calling all of us to follow him, to be a part of something bigger, something greater, and something far more meaningful. It's like saying, you, yes, you, are part of this incredible journey to spread love and to make this world a much better and brighter place. And so I love looking at the calling of the 12 because it reminds me that you and I also have a unique calling to be a part of God's kingdom and the ministry and mercy of the master. So let's talk a bit about the background of James because James is often referred to as James the Greater to distinguish him from James the son of Alphaeus was one of the sons of Zebedee. He was a fisherman in a town called Bethsaida, along with his brother, John. He worked as a fisherman, casting nets on the Sea of Galilee. James came from a very close-knit family, as his brother, John, was also a disciple of Jesus. So let's look at some of the key moments in James' life. And I do want to remind you, that you can get all of this information and a whole lot more in the free PDF that is down in the description box below. So make sure you access that. So let's look at some of the key moments. The first key moment in James's life was the call to discipleship. I want to turn to Matthew chapter 4, verse 21 and verse 22 to see the specific call into discipleship that James experiences with Christ. And it reads like this. Going on from there, he, that is Jesus, saw two two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother, John. So James and John are brothers. And they were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them and immediately They left the boat and their father and followed him. What a remarkable story that is. I mean, uh, you know, I was thinking as I was reading that about the days when I was growing up and on the little John boat with my father and how much I loved those moments, would love to, if it were possible to rewind time to relive those moments of being on the boat with my father. But yet there was something greater and bigger that called their attention and they left their profession. They also left their family behind to follow Jesus Christ. Because look at it again, they were on the boat, they were preparing their nets, they were with their father and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So there's some great lessons that we can learn here And James and his brother John were both called by Jesus to leave their fishing nets and to follow him. What is it that Christ has called you to leave to follow him? Because sometimes following Christ, no, not sometimes, at all times, following Christ will involve some sacrifices and some separation. And sometimes what we have to give up is something we love in order to follow him. So the first key moment in James's life is the call to discipleship. And again, we saw that in Matthew chapter 4, verse 21 and verse 22. Now let's go to the second key moment in James' life. The second key moment in James' life is that he was a witness to the transfiguration. So over the last couple of weeks, we talked about Andrew and Simon Peter, who were also brothers, and how 
Last week, I spent quite a bit of time, so I won't spend as much time this week talking about the transfiguration. But we talked about how these three were there when the prophet and Moses appeared before Jesus and Jesus began to change forms on the mountain of transfiguration. Well, he was right there with them. James was, Peter, James, and John. The trilogy that always seemed to kind of run together. So James was one of the three disciples along with Peter and John who witnessed that glorious transfiguration of Jesus when God began to speak from heaven. And in that experience, and I want you to go back and see last week if you missed it, in that experience, we have the presence of the law, which represents Moses, the prophets, which is represented by Elijah. We have the presence of the gospel or the new covenant, New Testament, which is uh, depicted by the presence of Jesus Christ, along with the presence of God, the Father who speaks from heaven and says, this is my son, hear him. And we also have, really, a picture of the church represented by Peter, James, and John, because as they were disciples of Christ and as they were to be those who would continue the work, work and word of the church and the Lord, it represents you and me. So James was indeed one who witnessed the transfiguration, and that was a very key moment in the life of James. So let me show you the third key moment in James' life. The third key moment in James' life is very interesting. It was a request for prominence in the kingdom of Christ. He requests prominence in the kingdom of Christ. So let's turn our attention to Mark chapter number 10. And I want to look at several verses here, verse 35 through verse number 45. So Mark 10, 35 through 39, or 40 actually says, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, this is the two brothers now, James the great and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came to him, that is to, to Jesus, and they said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, Let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. And notice Jesus' response. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? In other words, can you handle all that's involved being master and Messiah? You have no clue what you're really asking for. Verse 39, we can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong or belong to those for whom they have been prepared. Let's look at verse 41 through 45. When the 10, that would be the other of the 12 disciples besides James and John, when the 10 heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. So they just kind of went off. Verse 42, Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So what a very interesting discussion and dialogue that happened there, because James and John asked for positions of authority and honor in Jesus' kingdom. And it revealed their desire for leadership and their desire to be seen literally as prominent in the kingdom of God. Now, of course, many people have criticized them for this request. And what I love about it, though, is how when they make this request, 
the response that Christ initially gives to them is not to just instantly shut them down. But in fact, in verse 36, he said, what do you want me to do for you? All right. So it was an invitation to ask for something. So what is it that you want me to do for you? But he did tell them, listen, you're going to go through some things following in my footsteps. But where you're going to sit in terms of rank is not my decision. That's up to God. And then what was interesting to me also is that when the 10 heard about this, they verbally, at least, jumped all over James and John. And what a great discourse Jesus offers then in verse 42. Very interesting words here. Jesus called them together. And there are times that, and this would be the New Testament church at this stage and age of Christ's ministry here. There are times that the church bickers over positions, over titles, over perceived authority, and a lot of self-appointed significance and authority that we really don't have. It's just out of tradition. And yet, even today, Jesus is trying to still call the church together to stop bickering or fighting or warring over who's who and who's the biggest and who's the greatest and who's the most important and who's the most significant and that's my seat over there and all of those stupid things. I know that's a terrible word to use, so I won't say stupid again. But all of those things <laughs> that we bicker over, war over and fight over, and Jesus is trying to call the church together, you know? And he gives them this great discourse here. And I love how he sums it all up in that 45th verse by saying, even the Son of Man, notice the capitalization in S and M, and this was a title to which Christ referred to himself. Even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life for ransom for many. So it's a great lesson here for them and even for us today. That it's not about where you sit in church. It's not about how important you look. It's not about whether you wear a three-piece, a big hat, a bow tie, or expensive shoes. You can come in jeans with holes in them, at least at the church I pastor, and, and just serve. Just serve. That's what it's all about, family, is serving Christ, serving the world, being a great representation of Christ. But this is a key moment. In James' life, his request for prominence, very key moment in his life, because he learned what it meant to really serve God, and that is to serve the world, to serve the community, to serve out your time here on earth, which is very limited, honoring the Lord. So let's look at his fourth key moment in the life of James. So the fourth one and final key moment is his martyrdom for the faith. So James would lose his life, and it is actually recorded in scripture in the book of Acts, chapter number 12, where James is actually among the first of the martyrs that would lose his life for the sake of his Christian faith or his fellowship of the Lord Jesus. Let's look at Acts 12, verse 1. And verse 2. So it reads like this. It was about that time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church. Now, remember, just to set a little bit of context, this is after uh, the end of Luke and the first part of Acts where they have witnessed Jesus' ascension back to heaven. He spent 40 days, according to the Bible, here on the earth, and he was giving instruction and dialoguing and engaging with his followers at that time. Acts 2, the Holy Spirit comes. Um, Acts uh, chapter 6 and 7, the church just explodes with growth, and they appoint uh, leadership to help to facilitate the day-to-day -day needs uh, of waiting tables and serving and making sure that bickering is kept down um, amongst 
the church members, which is rapidly exploding. Well, when we get to Acts chapter number 12, the church is, is majorly going through persecution to the point that Herod is arresting uh, those who are associated with the Church of Jesus Christ because they are messing up religion incorporated and they're spreading this message about uh, forgiveness and peace with God through this man that they saw crucified that his followers reported to have resurrected and yet the ministry that he left is still going on and they're still proclaiming him to be God in the flesh, Christ to be God in the flesh, the Messiah, and all of that. And so this is upsetting religion incorporated. And so Herod, who was on the throne, is now arresting individuals who were connected to the church of Jesus Christ at that point. So about that time, King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. And notice verse number two, he had James, who is our disciple that we're working with this week, thinking of this week, the brother of John put to death with the sword. So James becomes the first of the apostles to be martyred for his faith in Jesus Christ. And as I think about that and how interesting that is, I talk to so many people who have so many complaints and so much is wrong and this person talked about me and I'm just suffering for Christ, quote unquote. And, and you know, uh, they don't like me over there. I'm just suffering be because of Christ. And I just want to tell people sometime, you, you're really not suffering because of Christ. You might be suffering because of poor interpersonal relationships. Um, you might even need some therapy, some counseling to help you to learn to let go of some stuff and to actually engage and love people and forgive. But if you really want to talk about suffering for Christ, try being drug out of a church service or in the middle of the night, being drug out of your bed, uh, dragged down the street and boiled in a hot kettle of burning oil, all because you will not recognize Caesar as, as God, but because you're still clinging to your belief in Christ. Try that for size. That, my friends, is what it means to be persecuted for Christ. Not this silly stuff that, that immature believers talk about. So he's put to death with a sword. And what's interesting is the inference here in verse number one is that his intent was to basically just begin the process Herod beginning the process of persecution, but to make a strong point to the believers, he executes James with a sword. All right. So he becomes the first martyr for the sake of Jesus Christ. So I hope you're getting something out of this study. Please leave a comment. And let us know. And don't forget also that there is a free PDF handout. You can get this whole teaching plus so much more that's included in it. It's right there in the description box below. So I want to leave you with four or five takeaways, lessons from James' life. Here's number one. We have to have faith in Christ's call. Faith in the call of Christ. Your action step for the week is this. Be willing to leave behind your comfort zone when Christ calls you to follow him. There may be some things or people or circumstances or relationships that even in this very moment that you're hearing me, that the Holy Spirit may be convicting you concerning that you need to relinquish so that you can embrace the call of Christ on your life. Now, hold on, because when people hear the word call of Christ, they automatically assume that God has called you to be a preacher, uh, to stand up in the pulpit, to, you know, to, to preach a sermon. No, everybody's not called to do that. God needs some people to be prayer warriors. 
He needs some people who are willing and excited to be an usher or willing and excited to just be a person who shows the love of God in this world to everybody you come into contact with. But whatever it is that Christ has called you to, embrace it and be willing to leave behind your comfort zone when Christ calls you to follow him. And here is lesson number two, witnessing God's glory. So you want to seek moments of divine revelation and draw closer to Christ in awe and in wonder. You know, remember that it was James, Peter, and John who witnessed the glory of God on the Mount of Transfiguration. But you know what? You and I should daily look for moments of divine revelation, moments where we are drawn so intimately close to the Lord through prayer, through worship, through reading of the scripture, through showing love to other people, through giving. And not just in church, that's a big part of it. We connect connect with God by giving, but also blessing somebody that you don't even know in a restaurant or wherever you may see someone. That is witnessing the glory of God. That is really seeing Jesus in his full glory. And people ought to see a transfiguration in you and me that is a result of the Holy Spirit at work in us and illuminating our lives. Here's number three, servant leadership. So embrace humility. Remember, James and John were wanting to be large and in charge in the kingdom of God. But one thing we learn here is about servant leadership. So embrace humility and servant leadership following the example that has been set by the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, if you want to be great, be a great servant. That's where greatness is. It's not always standing up front with the light shining on you. It's about letting the light shine through you, even when nobody sees you. All right. And here's number four. Have a willingness to suffer for Christ. So we need to be prepared to endure hardships for the sake of your faith, knowing that Jesus is worth every bit of every hardship. So be willing to suffer for him, whatever that may mean in your life. And finally, here's number five, seeking prominence in God's kingdom. So again, embrace humility, servant leadership, following the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't go after prominence. Don't go after being a big shot. Don't go after being seen or being on display. Instead, go after making him seen, making him on display, magnifying him. You know, those of us who wear eyeglasses will appreciate this analogy. It's nice when people compliment you on your frames. That feels nice. You know, all those frames look really nice on you. But you know what? Glasses are not meant to be seen. They're meant to be seen through. They are meant to magnify what is important and minimize what is too big. So if you think about that analogy, child of God, you and I are just lenses through which the world should be able to look through and see through and see God and the kingdom of God and Christ and the will of God magnified, but it ought to see us minimized, minimized, right? Does that make sense? All right, take, type yes in the comments if that makes sense. I just want to double check myself here. <laughs> so I want to encourage you this week to go back through this study, get the free to PDF handout below, because I think it will bless you real good just to really spend some time meditating on the key moments in the life of James. So I want to thank you so much for tuning in, for sharing this, for hitting the like, for subscribing, and do hit that bell notification so you're notified every time new content is loaded. 
again, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for being here. Thank you for commenting. Thank you for hitting that thumbs up and all that good stuff. We so appreciate you. Can't wait to share with you in part four. And until we come back again, hey, you go with God. Don't forget to subscribe and do get that free handout below. God bless you.